Hi, I'm just uh, trying to set it up so I can um, see anyone's comments. So, awesome. Got myself on my screen. So I see myself, which is incredibly weird. And yeah, I'm kind of in the right spot. Awesome. Um, so, it's bang on one o'clock, um, so I guess I'll get started. And if anyone has any questions, um, has anything they want to bring up, um, please feel free to just fire me um, a comment. Now, you guys might be able to hear, I put it on quite quietly, um, in the background, we've got a big mix of Scottish music. Everything from Jerry Cinnamon to Lewis Capaldi to the Proclaimers, um, all the way to Biffy Clyro and Skids. Um, obviously, you guys might not recognise many of those bands, um, but hopefully you'll enjoy it, even if it's quiet in the background. And um, if you can't hear me, and um, please just drop a comment, and I will um, fix that. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit. A little bit about our brand, but not too much. Um, I kind of want to go through whiskey. Um, what whiskey is, what makes whiskey maybe different to other spirits, um, how it's made, and that sort of thing. A bunch of different categories kind of make up whiskey. Um, so I want to go through all of those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, let's get started. If my PowerPoint wants to. There we go. So, for the most part, um, Scotch whisky is made up of three raw ingredients. Water, grain, and yeast. Now, water and yeast is pretty much the backbone for all um, forms of alcohol, um, and grain is what makes whisky whisky. Um, obviously, we've got it listed there, and you can see a nice little picture. It might be a little bit small on your screen, and you can see a picture. Grain has lots of different categorizations. Um, we talk about it as cereal grains. Um, and what you're looking at there is you're looking at barley, you're looking at maize, you're looking at corn, um, and you're looking at things like rice as well. Um, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, but just so you know, there's lots of different types of grain. Um, when we talk about single malt, um, we talk about one very specific. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So just a little bit history. Um, I won't talk too much because you probably can't read it. Um, but, you know, Scottish hi distilling history goes all the way back to 1494 um, at Lindoris Abbey. Um, it was a commission um, from the king. Um, Lindoris Abbey, as a distillery, um, disappeared. Nobody really knew much about it. Um, but thankfully, they've rebuilt a new distillery on the site. Um, so they've got some whiskey coming. And they currently have an aqua vitae. Um, and that's where we hark back to the Latin name um, for water of life, which is where we get uscabeta, which is garlic. Um, and that's where we get the term for whiskey. Um, we obviously see this if we look at lots of different other forms of spirits, um, that water of life or eau de vie, as you'll maybe hear it referred to in French. Um, this is just a classic example of the whole world kind of doing things as they go, and then it all sort of coming together. Um, everyone was using similar phrasing, but um, all in their own different languages. Um, We've sort of seen Scotch whisky kind of go up and down over the years, um, a lot due to things like exports and a lot of um, differences. But now we're back up to a very healthy amount of distilleries. We're up to over 120 distilleries. Um, the count in 2018 was 128, um, but I'm sure that'll be surpassed by now. Um, we've seen in the last 20 or so years quite a few new distilleries open up, um, which is only good. Um, places like Lindor's Abbey, um, or places that maybe you'll recognise more, places like Kilcoman. Um, and it's great to see more whiskey, because the more whiskey, the more people that are enjoying it. Now, whiskey, as we've got here, is broken down into seven little parts, seven processes. Now, some are incredibly important for deriving flavour, deriving structure, and some are a little bit different. Some are more just a process. Um, we're going to go through all of them. Um, but I don't want to make it too boring, um, so I won't go through them at incredible length, um, just enough so you guys get a little bit of basis. Again, um, I'm trying to keep up with any comments, um, so hello to Kai, Hey Park, Vita, 
um, Nino, um, and Trixie, and a, a bunch of others. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, and hello, Jeremy. Um, thank you for tuning in. And if you do have any questions, please pop them in. Um, awesome. So we'll get started on how whiskey is made. So we start off with um, malting. Um, malting is essentially a process of breaking down starch in grains um, into useful sugars. Um, as when we consume things like starch, um, our body doesn't automatically process them. We have to break it down into um, other types of sugars. So it's exactly the same idea. We start a form of germination, which is um, we allow them to soak in water. We allow them to convince themselves, these little grains, um, that they're going to grow. Um, what they then start to do is they then start to convert all that starch into sugars and into energy that they can then use to... Where is your 18-year-old? Um, still at the office, unfortunately, Jeremy. Um, it's a lock now, so I won't be able to get it till next week. Um, but I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. The, the white label's over there as well. Um, so what we have um, is we allow these um, little grains, we allow these little um, nodules of barley or maize um, to start to grow. Um, what that means is they don't actually shoot off spouts and start growing again, but they convince themselves that they are. What that means is they're converting the sugars for us. Now, we stop this with the very simple process of kilning. That essentially allows them to dry out. Now, we do this to start with just by reducing the water and allowing it to do it at a slower pace, and then we speed it up. Now, we've got it listed here that um, there's peat involved, um, and in a lot of cases that is correct. So, for example, if you're looking at Isla whiskies, um, you're looking at really like smoky, sort of um, rich flavour. That will often come from um, peat in the kilning process. Um, there's no peat thrown into the still, there's none in the cask. Um, and it was never a um, case of it was all about flavour, it was what they had. Um, they simply needed to burn something to make heat to dry off um, this barley or this corn. Um, and in the case of places like Isla, it was peat. Um, we also get peat in the highlands, um, but it gives a completely different flavour. So we now see other distilleries in the highlands um, using peat as well. Um, Aberfeldy um, still had some peated whisky. Um, I recently got to try their 40 year old and it was peated and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, and companies like Glengarry, up until they shut in the 90s, um, used predominantly peated um, malt as well. And the final, uh, the final phase here is milling. Now, milling is exactly what I would say is breaking down these little buds um, of barley, for example, into three different things. We've got basically the shells, we've got what we call the grist, which is a slightly finer powder, and then we've got the very, very fine powder, which is for all in... Show us your entire face, Dan. Okay, I'll try to across. Um, which is essentially flour. Um, depending on the distillery, depending on the style that you want to do, and you'll break these down into different um, proportions. Predominantly, the main part is going to be grist, um, with a little bit of husk and a little bit of flour on either end. Now, these things completely de change, completely depend um, on the distillery itself. Now, mashing. Mashing is something that is, um, as we think has been taken from um, lots of different phrases, but mashing is really actually quite simple. It's essentially taking this grist um, and adding hot water. Now, the reason for this, you might ask, is at, up until this point, we don't have any liquid. Um, we don't make um, whiskey, we don't make beer, wine from dry products. We need it to be a liquid. Um, and to convert that, we take the sugars that have been produced in the other processes so far, and we take them out and turn them into this really thick liquidy called sweet wort. Um, for you, those of you that work in bars, um, it's exactly the same idea of using a sugar syrup as opposed to using a fresh brown sugar. Um, obviously, it's all about using that ease and its ability to absorb those flavours. Um, this is mainly so that we can then convert it into a beer-like substance. Now, we take that sweet wort and we transfer it to these bad boys. Now, these are um, wash bags. This is where fermentation occurs. Now, fermentation, um, for those of you that don't know, is how we produce alcohol. We will talk a little bit about um, distillation afterwards, 
But whether you're talking about beer, whether you're talking about wine, whether you're talking about brandy, whether you're talking about any of those products, um, we are always talking about fermentation. It's the process of producing alcohol. Um, there's lots of complicated science involved if you really want to go into it. Um, Greg Benson, our India rep, has a degree in this subject, so if you have any questions that I can't answer, I will definitely fire them over. Um, but it's a simple process of taking the sugars that we've got, so we've got this really thick sugary liquid, and taking these sugars um, and adding yeast. Now, yeast is just a natural substance, and it's present in the air, and in certain environments, we don't need to add yeast. We can use natural yeast, natural fermentation. Um, unfortunately, we look for a specific temperature for this to occur. Um, because we don't want to denature the yeast, we look at around about 34 degrees. Um, for anyone that has been to Scotland, you will know that 34 degrees has probably never happened. Um, I don't know if Scotland's ever got above 30, um, but it might, it might have once in Bankery. Um, but what that means is we do it on a control. So we take what we call distiller's yeast um, and we add it to our um, wash bags. This process, the yeast basically ingests the sugar and gives out um, alcohol. In the same way we breathe in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide, it's just one of those natural processes that occur. I don't know how well you can see these images, um, but this little thing here, this all this bubbling away, um, this is what we call wash. What it essentially is, is a unhopped beer. Um, what that means is it's not overly tasty. Um, if you open one of these up when it is fermenting, you get hit in the face with this really thick, malty flavour. Um, what are you wearing on your legs? These, um, Base Spirits Collective, are flamingo swimming shorts. Um, it's one of the perks of living in the lovely tropical Thailand is that after this I'm going to make myself a sandwich and I'm going to go into the pool. Um, I don't know if that's Ian, um, but if it is, hello Ian um, from Base Spirits Collective. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, what we essentially have is a beer. Now this is how you, this is the same style of way you produce beer um, and if you were to take um, grapes and replace it for the grain, that's how we produce wine. It's really quite simple. Obviously, for those things, you've got to go really, um, you've got to go really in depth if you want to um, look at the science. But we're going to keep it quite simple for today. And finally, distillation. Now, distillation um, is quite a confusing process, but I'm going to keep it really simple. The boiling point of alcohol is lower than the boiling point of water. So I've got my handy kettle here. Um, funnily enough, next to the TV is actually where I keep my kettle. It's not just here for prop purposes. Um, and this is exactly how a still works. What we do is if we were to put beer in here, we boil it up, boil it up, boil it up. And then we set it to a temperature higher than the boiling point of alcohol. So all that alcohol will still stay a liquid. It won't evaporate and it'll stay as a liquid form. But we do it lower, higher than the boiling point um, sorry, higher than the boiling point of alcohol, but lower than the boiling point of water. Yeah, I'm going absolutely crazy, I think, with this. So what we do is all the water will stay liquid. I'm going to start this again. So because the boiling point of alcohol is lower than the boiling point of water, we need to find somewhere in between. Now, heating to that temperature in between means that all the water will stay in our lovely kettle, in our lovely still, and all the alcohol will evaporate off. Now... As we can see, there's this lovely little neck and there's lots of different intricacies, but it goes up this tube. Now, it goes into a separate condenser and it goes back to being a liquid. Um, now, obviously, we could just do this um, once, um, but in Scotch whiskey, to get that higher ABV that we need to start with, it starts with um, twice. Um, you can do this several times. If you're looking at something like a vodka, you'll use a different type of still. If you're looking at Irish whiskey, they often do it three times. And there are even some scotches that do it three times as well. Um, you've got things like Ock and Toshin, um, but for most scotch whiskies, it'll be twice the still. I love the props, mate. Yes, they are just here, just on. Ah, here we go. Now, maturation. Um, maturation, as far as flavour goes, most people believe to be the most important thing. The reason for that is a lot of those flavours 
um, are taking out of the wood that we get in whiskey. If you think about it this way, um, whiskey can be aged for 12, 15, 12, 12 years. Um, we're now seeing whiskies 50 plus years. Um, what that means is this whole fermentation, distilling, germination process, um, you know, maybe takes a matter of weeks um, from everything, whereas you, know, you can put it into a maturation. Um, process where it will last years and years and years. Now if you just look at that on a proportion scale, where do you think you're going to get a lot of that flavour? Now these are obviously casks um, and we have to put what we call new make spirit um, and add it into the wood. Now what you can see here um, is what we call toasting or charring. Um, and there's a few reasons that we do this. Um, and 18 on the rack, Jeremy Briscoe, you should sort him. Yeah, I also think um, that Jeremy should sort me out with an 18, 25 and 30, that would be absolutely fab, just saying. Um, but the main reason that we look at these um, processes is, as you can imagine, when you cut down a tree, you don't automatically get these lovely shapes for these little things called staves um, to make into a barrel. To make into a barrel, originally they would have done it around a fire, and what I did is it made it easier to bend, and it was simple. Nowadays, um, that we know a little bit more, we know that charring the barrels and toasting the barrels, depending on how you want to do it, um, would add a lot of flavour. What that means is when you toast these barrels, um, you allow it to bring out lots of different flavours from the wood. And it also helps the spirit itself penetrate further. Now, there are lots of different grades that we can toast and char. So if you're looking at like sherries and wines, um, it'll be you know, toasted, it'll be lightly done on the inside. If you're going to bourbon, um, they have one called alligator, um, which essentially means it's been blitzed at an incredibly high temperature for just under a minute, um, and it's black on the inside with an almost alligator skin um, appear appearance. Um, now these are all going to add ever so slightly different flavours. Um, so there's lots of different whiskies. Um, with ever so small variations, but I'll talk a little bit more about it as we sort of go along. As I said, whiskey must be matured in oak casks for a minimum of three years. Um, this is absolutely um, the rules. There are no exceptions to it in terms of whiskey. Um, we have seen some companies um, move away from being so strict. Um, as a brand, um, we almost entirely use um, age statements. Um, and what that means is these age statements um, don't refer to the average, they refer to the youngest in the bottle. But we also see non-age statements. So as long as it's above three years old, um, you can call it whiskey, you can call it scotch, and you don't have to put an age on it. But if you are, it has to be the youngest in spirit in the bottle. By the way, the reason I keep reaching across is because I have two laptops. One is controlling the PowerPoint, and one is so I can kind of weirdly watch myself. Um, as well as watching your comments, and I keep going to click the wrong ones. But there are two main types of barrels. Um, we've got American oak, um, which is generally going to be ex-bourbon barrels, and these are just some of the key flavours. We've got coconut, vanilla, toffee, caramel, almonds. Now, these are the most popular, um, and the reason they're the most popular is probably for one reason. They are the cheapest. And the reason for that, good old bourbon, um, requires virgin casks, so first use, first fill casks. Um, what that means is that every single time um, a company like Maker's Mark or Jack Daniels or um, Angel's Envy uh, decides to make bourbon or make wh American whiskey, um, they then have to throw that barrel out straight after use. Now, obviously, they're not going to throw these barrels in the bin, you know, they're quite expensive, um, but we see them pop up all over the world. We see them for um, Scotch whiskey, but we also see them for other products as well. Noticeably, um, tequilas, mezcals, and um, the chances are they're going to be using bourbon barrels as well. Um, and then the second type is European oak or ex sherry cask. Slightly different flavours, you're going to get slightly more warm spice flavours, um, as well as these sort of um, dried fruits. Um, things like sultans, raisins, and um, it says Christmas cake, but to me that just again means those really rich and um, sort of plummy flavours. Um, now, there's lots of different types of sherry, and we're not going to talk about that too much today. Maybe that'll be something um, for a later date if people are interested. 
Um, but when we just say X Sherry, it can be anything from um, Fino to Pedro Jimenez. Um, so there's lots of different combinations as well. Now, this is a picture of whiskies of the world, and it's something I've actually been meaning to update ever since I started. The main reason is because it misses out a lot of places. We've obviously got Ireland, we've got Spain, we've got Italy, we've got the Nordic countries, Japanese, American, um, and a big list down here, but there are a lot more nowadays. Um, obviously based here in Thailand, um, we have whiskey, Philippines they have whiskey, um, countries all over the world are producing this grain spirit. Um, what makes whiskey different from other spirits in terms of taste? Okay, awesome, I will get to that at the end for sure. Go. Um, so Japanese whiskey, um, so I'm going to talk about the three main whiskies besides Scotch for just a wee second. Um, and we've got Japanese whiskey, um, now we've got Yamazaki, Nika um, are definitely the most popular two and the most popular you can get all around the world. Um, and these go all the way back to the early part of the 20th century. Um, Takatsuru, um, who was trained in Scotch whiskey distilleries, I believe he went to Strathclyde University. Um, when it was uh, a technical college, um, he trained um, how to distill whiskey the Scottish way. So when you see Japanese whiskey, it'll almost always be without that E. Um, there's no legal reason for other whiskies, things like American bourbon, things like Irish whiskey, to use an E or not. Um, it's all just to do with personal preference. Now, I'm not going to say that one is better, one is worse, but it's all just different depending on the brand. Um, most people believe American whiskey will be E, but you've got to make it smart, but still use it. Um, awesome. Um, just a last point about Japanese whiskey. Um, as I mentioned, one of the big things that we've seen, especially in recent years, is different cereal grains being used for whiskey. Now, one of the most common um, that we've seen used is rice. Now, a lot of people, a lot of whiskey fans out there, um, I might even get some comments disagreeing with me on this, will say, well, if it's made of rice, you know, it's, it's not whiskey. Um, as far as Japan goes, they don't really have any regulations on it. Um, they can use part um, grain-based spirits, partly neutral spirits, um, but rice in itself is a style of grain. Um, so who am I really to argue? Um, if you argue with most Scotch um, supporters, they will tell you it's absolutely not whiskey, but I'll leave that up to yourselves to have a think. Um, then we've got American whiskey. Now, we've got the three main types that you notice here. Um, rye, Tennessee and bourbon. Um, Tennessee is one of the biggest producers but there's less brands. We've got Jack Daniels, um, I think it's Dickel as well, um, and then we've got things like rye and bourbon. Now these are made ever so slightly differently in that they are almost always blends of multiple grains. Um, in the case of bourbon it'll be things like corn as long as it's 51% of the mash and things like rye will be 51% rye of the mash. You can get different proportions, um, you know, you can get lots of different things to do with that. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much because we love scotch here, um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask if it's about any of these products, and um, I will try and answer as well as I can. And then, finally, Irish whiskey. Teeling, Jameson, Tom or Dew, and Bushmills are the ones we've got here. Um, nowadays, there are lots and lots of Irish whiskey distilleries. Now, this isn't a new thing. Um, not so long ago, Irish whiskey was the most popular um, spirit in the world. But, unfortunately, due to things like independence, civil wars, um, issues with importation and exportation to places like the UK, and then prohibition in America, kind of made a lot of those distilleries shut down. At one point, they believed they had over 60, and they went all the way down to basically two or three. Um, and at one point we had um, basically New Middleton and Bushmills were basically the only two and they were owned by the same company. So, you know, Irish whiskey had its dip, it had its time, um, and now we're seeing a big incline again. Um, it's been one of the fastest growing spirits in the market um, ever since, the, I think it's 1990, it's been the fastest growing spirit. And um, that might have changed now, I think tequila um, might have updated that, but it's one of the fastest growing spirits in the world. Um, now obviously, Scotch whiskey is the best, don't let anyone tell you otherwise, um, but in a pinch, Irish whiskey is also great. Now, for Scotch whiskey, um, we have five different categories. I already mentioned that American whiskey can be split up 
um, into things like rye, bourbon, Tennessee, um, Irish whiskey as well, you can go to things like pot still, blended, um, malt and all these small categories as well. Um, but for Scotch whiskey we have five. Now these, as far as categorizations, are still relatively new. Um, the most recent act, I believe, is going back to 2009. Um, we used to use, frame, used to use uh, phrases like vatted um, or vatted malts. Um, thankfully, a couple of troublemakers, good troublemakers, um, in the mid-2000s um, started producing whiskey with a little bit, um, a little bit of controversy. Um, what that meant was that the laws were tightened. Um, whether this is good or bad um, is completely up to yourselves. Um, but I'll talk mainly about these two um, in a second, but I'll just quickly go over grain and blended grain. The style of distillation that we talked about before, um, that put the spirit in, the put the spirit in, distill it, get more spirit out, X, Y, Z, um, is how we would use um, a pot still. Um, that is how we make things like single malt. Um, for grain whiskies, we can use um, column stills. What this means is it's a continuous style of distillation that is cheaper to run, creates a better yield for alcohol content, and you can produce higher um, alcohol content spirit. Um, these create a completely different style of whiskey, and is how we produce blended Scotch whiskey. Um, but as far as single grain goes, or even blended grain, aren't overly popular. Whether they're overly popular for any main reason, I'm not going to say. Um, a lot of people judge quality purely on price. The fact that they are cheaper to make means that they are often um, cheaper to buy and therefore some people would have this view that they are worse. Obviously that is complete rubbish. Um, I imagine a lot of you guys have been to a really, really nice expensive restaurant and been really, really disappointed. Um, you know, it's the same idea. Sometimes the street food is just as good as the Michelin star. Um, just because something costs a lot of money to make or to buy doesn't mean it's infinitely better. Um, Scotch grain whiskey, you're not going to get much of it in the bars or even in the supermarkets. Um, places like Strathclyde, North British um, and Loch Lomond um, are producing your sort of really good grain whiskies at the moment. Um, they are used for all blended whiskies as well. So single malt is probably the easiest style of whiskey to explain. Um, we've got our lovely bottle of Aberfeldy here. Um, what we do is we produce it in one distillery, we make our new make, exactly the same process we talked about before, and then we take all the different barrels, we blend it together, and we produce a single malt. Now, as you can see, there's more than one type of barrel. There's this really strong misconception um, that you take whiskey out of a barrel, you maybe add water to it, and you put it straight in a bottle. Now this happens. Um, single cask and bottlings happen all the time especially for things like distiller exclusive or independent bottlers. As far as what we would consider um, the sort of hallmark brands, these use lots of different casks from the same distillery. Whether these ages are 12.5, 13, the youngest whiskey in these casks will be 12, and that has to be the age statement. If we took half a cask of 12-year-old and half a cask of 25-year-old Aberfeldy, and we put them in together and bottled it, what you're looking at is um, and again, a single malt, but it's going to have to be 12 years old. Um, these are obviously all different um, depending on what sort of whiskey you're making, but that's how we do it. What this means is all those different processes we talked about at the beginning, things like charring, toasting, and whether you use a cask once, whether you use a cask eight times, um, are all about activating different flavors. Wood is a completely natural substance. So what that means is you don't need use the same process, char it for the same length of time, put it in a cask, wait the same amount of time, and it's going to taste the same. Um, that would be amazing. Um, that would probably make a lot of whiskey makers' jobs a hell of a lot easier. Um, but unfortunately, um, that's not how it works. So it's the case of our master blender, and um, in our case, the lovely Stephanie McLeod, um, to take all these different barrels and blend them together. To get, to get the flavor of Aberfeldy. Now, when I say that, what that means is it's producing the same whiskey year after year after year with the same quality, the same delicious flavor, and that you're not necessarily using exactly the same recipe of barrels. Um, so when people say, oh, how much um, you know, 12 year old or how much 16 year old is in this, um, it changes completely. It's all about getting flavors as opposed to necessarily about producing the same thing over and over again. Um, for anyone that's a cook, recipes are great, 
um, but I imagine you've made something absolutely delicious one day and um, tried to follow the recipe the next day with um, maybe slightly fresher tomatoes or um, slightly smaller leaves of mint or anything like that and it tastes completely differently. Um, that's exactly the same idea. You know how much you can try and control it, there's still that element of nature. Um, so it's still a process of blending. Now, this is blended malt. This is the second category. And um, this is taking three lovely single malts. Um, for example, in our, um, in our company, it would be Royal Brackla, Altmore, Aberfeldy, Frugelke. Um, so four in that case. Putting them together, again, that maximum aging, the minimum aging is still going to apply, um, but blending them to create a blended malt. Now, the most popular is William Grant's um, Monkey Shoulder. Um, and as far as blended malt, that's probably most of what you're going to see on the market. Um, the reason for that is the minute you say it's blended, um, again, we see that inclination that it's going to be cheaper. Blended malt is made in exactly the same process as using um, three lovely single malts, um, or four, or five, or six, or seven, or eight lovely single malts and blending them together. Um, and therefore, there's a lot of people have this opinion that if it's blended, it's cheaper. Um, there's nothing cheaper about this process of making blended malt than making single malt. Um, obviously, we don't have an age statement on things like monkey shoulder, but there are ones with an age statement. So that's not something either. Um, hi, Mike. So then we have blended scotch. Um, blended scotch um, is taking the process of all of these different styles of whiskey, which are all single malt, for example, and then single grain whiskeys that I talked about before. Um, single grain and um, blended scotch whiskey takes up 90% of all scotch whiskey in the world. So a lot of people, um, especially maybe whiskey aficionados, um, will tell you, oh, I only drink um, single malt, I only drink this, I only drink that. Um, they're not in the majority, 90% um, is blended. Um, so we've got the big brands here, things like um, Black Label, Shivas Regal, and Duras would also come into this, um, but I'll explain a little bit different later. So it's taking whiskies from lots of different distilleries, and blending them all together and releasing them. Now, again, the same rule applies to all Scotch whisky, that the minimum age of the bottle is the minimum age of the whisky. Um, 12 years old on Duras, it means that every single single drop of whiskey is 12 years old. If I were to take a single bar spoon of Aberfeldy four-year-old and drop it into a 500 litre cask of this bad boy, what we're actually left with is we're going to have to label it as a four-year-old whiskey. Um, the same thing applies for single malts. If you take even the tiniest amount and add something that's not that distillery, you can't call it a single malt. Um, for those processes, it's called teaspooning, um, and we don't really see it with age statements, um, but we have um, Compass Box did one. Um, they released a whiskey that wasn't officially a whiskey because it used an um, 18-month-old whiskey-like um, product um, to get their sort of flavor profile. Um, for that reason, they couldn't call it whiskey because the whole product wasn't three years old. And then, again, very similar process up until now um, for producing our lovely jurors. But what we do is just one little thing different, and this is almost all of what I'm going to say in um, referring to jurors today. Um, but we do this process of double aging. Now, this was quite common uh, at, the, um, at other parts of history, um, but due to costing and due to things like that, it's kind of gone out of um, popularity. What we do is we take a exhausted cask. Now, what that means is, as I said, cask can be used time and time again. And we take an exhausted cask um, and take our lovely Jura's 12 year old and place it in that cask. Now, we're not looking for lots of additional flavors, we're not looking for um, anything like that. What we're looking for is this lovely picture of a married couple. Um, what we're looking for is taking all those flavors and you know, allowing them to harmonize. Um, I always think of it like making soup. You can't just take all of your lovely ingredients, or all of your lovely individual whiskies, um, throw them in a pot, blitz the heat up, and blend it. I mean, you could. However, if you, you know, put all those things in together, um, if you put all those things in together and allow it to macerate, allow it to sit, and allow all those flavors to sort of harmonize for a while, you're not adding any extra flavors, and you're not really doing anything more, but you're just allowing those flavors to come together. And it's also why some things like soup can taste even better the second day. And how long 
for a barrel to finish its job. Can we use it? Um, so I've just got a weak question. Um, basically, can we use it like forever? That completely depends on the barrel. Obviously, you can't use it forever. Um, I've seen cask keys up to five or six times. Um, normally, you would be looking at like three or four for a cask. Um, every cask, because it's a natural product, will have a, its own sort of lifespan. Um, I'm sure there have been casks that have only been used once or twice and everyone's gone, no, we're not going to get really anything from that. Um, so it's all about each individual cask. Um, I don't know the max that's ever been used in a um, sort of single barrel whiskey, um, but I can't imagine this any more than maybe four or even possibly five. Um, that would be my answer to that. Um, so now is the time to fire in some questions. Um, if you like. Now, just while we were on the topic, again, of it not being the same recipe, um, these are our five lovely, lovely single malt that, um, as, a, as a company Bacardi owns. Um, now, for example, these could all be used in the production of Duras 12. Um, but, if for example, um, we are not, if for example, we don't need to use all of them, you know, we will use different whiskies up to 40 sometimes um, to create the right flavour. It's not about using that recipe, it's not about using these single malt, these grain whiskies and putting them together, it's about getting the right flavour. Um, when asked, um, somebody asked actually the other day, um, which grain whiskies do we use to create Juras as a product? Um, and the answer was, over time we have probably used all of them. Um, and it's all about getting those different flavours from those different whiskies to produce the right thing. Um, I am freezing on mine, but I hope I'm not freezing on yours. Um, ah, there we go. So what makes whiskey um, different in terms of other spirits, in terms of taste? So whiskey in terms of other spirits will depend on what spirit you're comparing it to. Um, obviously you've got things like brandy, which again you're going to get that sort of oaked flavour, you're going to get those um, ripe fruits and vanillas from different types of casks, um, and the same with things um, like dark aged rum. Um, when it comes to whiskey, you're going to have that malty flavour, um, and that applies across all whiskies: Irish, um, Scotch, Japanese, and um, American, and Taiwanese, and all of the other whiskey-producing countries that I didn't mention. Um, but it's all about, it's about getting that sort of malty flavour. Um, if we then look at things like you know rum, you're going to normally get a completely different flavour because you're using a different um, star product. You're using um, sugar of some sort. Um, it's all about getting those ever so slight different flavours. Um, comparing it to things like white spirits, the main difference is that ageing. You know, comparing it to vodka or gin um, or you know, unaged tequila, um, you're not going to have any of those oaked flavours. Um, you're not going to have any of those um, sort of more warming, sort of spiced flavours you're going to get um, from having something in a barrel for a prolonged period of time. Um, adding a prolonged period of time obviously has its um, downsides. What we have is an angel's share. So the angel's share is the amount of whiskey that evaporates in the cask over time. Um, this will has lots of different variations. If we look at things like bourbon or rum that's aged um, in the Caribbean, it's going to have a much higher angel's share than, say, scotch. Scotch we normally look at around 2-3% to a year, but for example, if you look at things like Aberfeldy 40 year old, imagine 2-3% of the barrel every year for 40 years, and that's quite a lot of money. And that is one of the reasons that Older whiskey generally seems to cost more. Um, the other reason when we're talking about it, um, as I mentioned, prices and everything, um, there's definitely a sense of rarity being a cost in price. So it's not necessarily people will buy things purely for flavour. Um, a lot of people like to buy things purely because there's not many of them. Um, vintage cars are not going to run as smoothly as a modern day um, Mercedes, but when there's only five of them left, um, they'll cost a hell of a lot more. Um, I'm not saying that that has to automatically apply to whiskey. Often aged whiskies are um, better, but it's all about personal preference. Um, next week my talk is going to be on highballs and carbonation um, and all those sorts of things. Um, but um, so whiskey is all about how you prefer to enjoy it. Um, now, do I have any last questions just because I don't want to seem like I'm droning on? Um, I think Oh, well, I think my screen's frozen, um, but yeah, um, if you do have any questions, 
um, please feel free to message me and um, send a DM. I'll be up again on Friday doing um, the same presentation. So if you just joined quite late, um, please feel free to join then as well. I um, hope you guys have enjoyed and I hope you guys have had a good time. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And then, um, oh, one last thing. Uh, my t-shirt is a quote from Dormy Duo, which is, work in the morning, play in the afternoon. And as it is now 20 to 2, play in the afternoon. Slash.